What we're really, really talking about here is taking something uh, quite large and putting it in a very small box, uh, where the box here is system F omega, uh, so-called because of the nearly infinite amount of swearing you will do if you try and write any substantial program in it. Um, it's, uh, it's not fun, but that's why we have compilers. Um, and as uh, compiler writers, our job is to take things that are, are, are quite big, like recursive data types, and fit them into these, into these, these, these smaller systems uh, that are much nicer to reason about, but maybe don't have all of the, the things that uh, we're used to and we'd like. And as much as possible, we want to resist the temptation to just add data types to system F omega and make it bigger and, and, and bake all that stuff in. Uh, because then, as um, Phil has said repeatedly, then we're no longer using that, 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 that wonderfully ancient system uh, that, we, that, that we, we know and love, and instead some, 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 something newer and, a bit, and less, uh, uh, perhaps less trustworthy. Um, uh, and today I'm going to hope to convince you that, uh, in fact, uh, the box is big enough and uh, we, can, we, can, we, can, we can fit a surprising amount in there. And a lot of what I'm going to say uh, builds on stuff that is, is, is not new and may well be known to many of you. But as far as we know, uh, nobody has put, quite put all the pieces together in the way that we're, we're doing now. Uh, and it certainly took us long enough to put them together. So I, I, hope, this will, I hope this will be interesting. Um, so just as a bit of a recap and a bit of context for why are we actually doing this? Why do we care? Well. The thing we actually care about is Pluto score. This is our um, this is our language that actually runs on the blockchain, that, and that's the thing that matters. But for all intents and purposes, and this is the and this is the great thing, it just is system F omega. So you will not hear the words Pluto score again in this pr presentation. You can effectively forget about it, um, and th that that that's nice. We can just think about think about the the problem in more generality. System F omega, as it is normally presented does not have data types. So a quick reminder for those of you who maybe don't spend all of your time thinking about the lambda calculus. System F omega is pretty much the simply typed lambda, lambda calculus with uh, polymorphism and higher kinds. So this means that we can also have things like, uh, things like, things like lists as well, uh, which we want. Um, but we do want data types. We want to be able to reason about them. So part of what we're, we're trying to do in the long run is to have a, a system where people can write pretty much Haskell and have it turn into Plutus core that runs on the blockchain. And Haskell has data types, so we, we've got to do something with these things. That's part of, part of what we like about Haskell. So we need some way to encode them, and Phil has already told you about that, so we ha there's a number of well-known ways of doing this. Um, so the most famous is the church encoding, but um, that has some fairly serious efficiency problems, uh, so we don't use that. Uh, instead, uh, we use what's called the Scott encoding. And the Scott encoding is based on one key insight uh, which is that we can think about what, 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 it, what we can characterize a value um, of a, a data type by what we can do with it. And, well, what's the thing that you can do with a data type value? You can pattern match on it. And so if we kind of pull on this thread and, uh, and just keep, keep try, try and take, it, take seriously the idea that what it is to be a value of a data type is to be able to be pattern matched on, um, then we end up uh, developing quite a nice encoding uh, for these things. So let's actually do that. Let's just go through in a, bit, in a bit more detail how we actually get there. So let's start with just a simple pattern match. So we have some value m of type maybe a in, in Haskell parlance. Um, we're going to pattern match on it. And in the case where it's just, we're going to apply some function f to the thing inside it. In the case where it's nothing, we're going to use some value g. Um, and if you sort of think about it for a bit, you can sort of convince yourself that really any uh, pattern match on a, a maybe value is going to have to look something like this for some suitable choice of f and g. And then we can just sort of start abstracting. So we can pull out, pull out the scrutiny, which is compiler jargon for that thing that, um, that thing that you're pattern matching on. So we take some argument of type maybe a, and then, well, we need to, we need to also be polymorphic over this a, so we're going to use system f's big lambda that lets us, uh, lets us bind, uh, bind type variables like that. Uh, okay, so now we have some polymorphic function that takes, takes maybe a, so far so good. Take the next step, pull out the, these implementations of the case branches, this f and g. Well, what do they look like? They've got a, f's got to take a thing of the type that's inside and give you some result type. g's got to, well, just be of that type. And they've got to be the same because your case expression needs to have a single type, which is r in this case. And again, we'll, we want to be polymorphic over that. So we'll, we'll bind that as well. And if at this point we sort of look at this and think, this looks very familiar, and it's, it's really just an old friend. This is, you know, maybe from the Haskell prelude, which, uh, you know, has been around for a very long time. It's, it's, you know, the arguments are in a different order, and it, it, it's, they're using b instead of r, but it's, it's the same function. Um, so this is, this is not, this is not an, 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 an unusual way of thinking about, about data type values. We're essentially saying, 
well, let's 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 think about their destructors, the things that allow us to destroy them and 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 get out and do something with what's inside them. Um, and so we might then think, well, let's let's go a bit further. What if that just was the type? So let's 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 try and define maybe our type. Um, so it's a it's a parameterized type. So it's going to take we're going to take some a as as a, a of kind star. So type as a as a parameter. And well, what's the type of that that pattern matching function? Well, it was polymorphic over the result type. So we've got to have a for all here. And then well, it took two functions to do the two cases. The just branch, this is A to R, and there's nothing branch this R. And then at the end, what you get, your prize is actually a value of that type. Okay, that okay seems to be going well. We we'll keep pulling on the threads. What's what's next? Well, we need constructors. Um, but actually, all of our choices are forced here. It just it just it just sort of comes out. You know, you've got to again polymorphic over A, take an argument of type A because well, it's a the constructor for just. It takes an argument. Got to bind this guy in order to match the type signature. Got to take these guys in order to match the type signature. Two branches, and then well, we've got the just case branch and an argument of type A. There's really nothing to do except apply one to other, um, and uh, that that does it. And if you sort of look at this, you realize that what you've done is you've inverted the control of pattern matching. So rather than sticking a tag into the piece of data that the consumer can look at and decide what to do. Instead, you hand both of your alternatives to the piece of data and let it choose for you. And it, how does it know how to choose? Well, it, when you constructed it, you told it how to choose. And this then does what you expect. There is no pattern matching anymore. There's just function application. So uh, because a data type value simply is a pattern matcher. So if we use this curly bracket syntax to indicate instantiating our polymorphic functions, we construct a, a just one, we pattern match it as an integer of pi plus one, and I'm just going to tell you that that evaluates the right thing, and you can do it yourself on pen and with a piece of paper if you don't believe me. Um, so this is fine. This is, this is great. We can do sort of standard Haskell 98 data types with this. Wonderful. Everybody's happy. But what about recursive types? Uh, we really, really want recursive types. Like, I don't know if you've ever tried programming without lists, but it sucks. <laughs> you can't do anything. Um, anything interesting, whether you've got a variable amount of data, it's, it's, it's really uh, not great. Uh, so we want to do that, but we can't just crank the handle. So as Phil said, you know, he had his, had his NAT example, we have exactly the same thing, where you know, if you just write out, write out your, def your definition, well, bugger, you use the same, you use the thing that you're defining. You can't just do that. You have to have some way of tying the knot of, of um, having a, some kind of recursion or fixed point combinator at the type level. Um, otherwise, uh, this is just defining some infinite thing that's not going not gonna to make you happy. Um, so those of you who've read types in programming languages are probably checking your watch and wondering why I'm uh, wasting your time. Can't we just add a fixed point combinator to your, your, your type system and then everything is fine? Um, you define your types as fixed points. So if we look at have the NAT example, um, you know, you just take your fixed point, you feed it in instead this type level function that takes what we often call this pa the pattern functor and takes the takes the you know the, the, the recursively defined value and defines defines the type in terms of that, and then the fixed point. Well, you unfold that to infinity, um, and indeed this is the approach we're, we're, we're going to take, um, uh, or a, a similar approach. And you have to do. You have to add a little bit of complexity to handle that. So you have seen, uh, if you recall Phil's slide, there were these mysterious wrap and unwrap terms in the term grammar, um, and these just witness the um, the isomorphism between a fixed point and unrolling it one step. So if we, if you remember this perhaps familiar Haskell data type, you have this constructor that takes you from an f fix f into a fix f, and well, pattern matching on it is unwrapping, uh, but we can't use a recursive data type to define recursive data types because we don't have them. That's the whole problem. <laughs> so instead, we have some terms that fulfill this function for us. Um, and again, so far, all so fairly standard. Um, um, and in fact, we don't use uh, we don't use uh, uh, we use this variant of of a fixed point combinator, which is called ifix, um, short for indexed fix. Um, and this is starting to answer one of the questions you can have about a fixed point combinator, which is, well, what is its kind? Um, what sort of things are you allowed to pass in as these pattern functors? 
functors. So this thing here is this is of you know star to star. That's 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 useful. That's nice. You can do things. You can do natural natural numbers with that. Um, but you might want something a bit a bit more complicated. And um, we'll need a bit of extra power in order to do mutually recursive data types, which we're going to come to. Um, it also lets you define things like lists nicely and uh, do irregular data types. But it turns out that in, we can do enough with this variant. And what this variant has is it, instead of taking something of type kind star, it takes something of kind k to star for any k. So you do things, you handle things which take one type argument of arbitrary kind, um, but that's it. Um, and it turns out that this is enough to do everything we care about um, while still being uh, fairly tractable um, uh, from the theoretical point of view. Um, so uh, that's the kind of basic story. Um, and I'm now going to hand over to Roman, who's going to uh, show you in a little bit more detail um, uh, how we get to the encoding of uh, mutually recursive data types um, using this machinery. We know how to encode si simple data types now, uh, but we needed to encode something more complicated, which is mutually rec recursive data types, also irregular that, that data types. I won't touch the later here, but we will see how to encode mutually recursive data types. <coughs> Um, when we stumbled upon this problem, we searched the literature, but we were unable to find a solution to our problem. Uh, there were solutions that require a, either extending our language, or um, they had some really bad complexity, like factorial or something. <coughs> so we needed to invent something. We will use this example. Uh, it's uh, the tree forest family. A tree um, has only one construct, it's node. A node carries an A and a forest A. A forest A is essentially a list of trees. Um, <coughs> as a list, it has uh, the constructor for the empty list uh, and uh, the constructor that allows to add a tree to a forest. That's an example of a tree. We will use this simple family and uh, improve it in a few steps in order to arrive uh, at the representation that is system F uh, omega compatible. There is a really well-known trick. It's, it goes to at least 1999 when Conor McBride's thesis was published. <coughs> Let me read it. A mutual definition can always be represented as a single inductive family of data types indexed by a finite type whose elements label the branches. We might define a family parity 2 to type with parity true containing the even numbers and parity false odd numbers. Uh, applying this trick to our case, we get the following. <coughs> there is one huge tree force data type. It encodes both tree and forest data types that we had previously. Here are all the constructors from the previous family. They have literally the same types, but now forest uh, and tree are instances of the same data type. Tree forest is parameterized by, well, actually indexed by tree forest tag, <coughs> which determines whether a tree forest is actually a tree or a forest. So this is a well-known trick. It uh, allows us to get rid of mutual recursion. We still have this mutual keyword, but it's only for convenience and readability. Mm, those two definitions can be just in light in the type of constructors. They are not necessary. <coughs> so what we achieve here is that we got rid of mutual recursion. This is the next step. We have the same tree forest data type, but now it only has one constructor, which is tree forest. Uh, it captures the notion of recursion, uh, but the actual contents of this constructor is determined by the tree forest f type level function. <coughs> uh, this type level function matches on tag uh, in order to figure out whether we construct a, a, a tree or a forest. Since a tree contains only one constructor node, which carries an A and the forest A, we encode this as follows. This is the constructor of tree, the type of this constructor. Uh, forests have two constructors, nil, which does not carry any information, 
uh, and uh, cones which carries a tree and a forest. Uh, this is known as a sum of products representation. It's also well known. <coughs> These data types remain the same. Type alias section. <coughs> So what we achieved here is that we separated recursion from the actual contents of the data type. And once recursion is separated, it can be abstracted. That's our central primitive, what we use, what Michael has shown you. <coughs> um, we can compare it to the simple fix that is very common. It's uh, in Haskell base, in data fix or something. <coughs> <coughs> um, with this fix, you can mm, easily tie knots uh, in simple data types like natural numbers, but it doesn't quite work when you have some complicated data types like mutually recursive data types. Because in the net example, uh, there is only one recursive case, net, but when we encode tree and forest, we have two recursive cases, tree and forest. Uh, yes, they are defined in terms of the same data type, but they are still distinct. They are indexed by different tags. And so we need to somehow push tags in. And that's how we do this. We, this, we have this X of type A, and we parameterize the uh, pattern function no, not only by uh, the rec recursive case, but also by some X which F can use in order to determine what to do with uh, actual recursion. <coughs> Applying this to our case, we get the following. Um, that's all basically the same as we, have, we had previously. We have this type aliases as before. They're just local now, although we have global ones as well. We have tags. We match on text in order to figure out what to store in constructors. It's all the same. The only thing that changed is that we now use ifix for handling recursion for us. And know that we do not have the data keyword anywhere here. It's now handled by ifix. We no longer need some special data construction mechanism. <coughs> so if we have this ifix primitive, we don't need anything else. We can encode mutual recursion using just it. But what about system F omega? We don't have data types at the type level in system F omega. We don't have pattern match in there. We need to somehow replace these things marked in red. Well, we can just inlay pattern matching. If you want data, just encode it. That's what we was using this entire presentation. So a tag is something that takes two types and returns one of them. Three tags return the first and four tags returns the second. And here we just apply tag to uh, the encoded version of constructor of node, or of tree which is node, uh, and to constructors of forest which is nil and cons. So this ifix is well known too, you can find it on Hackish in some libraries. Uh, similar tricks are used in the uh, type theory field, but this simple thing is what we were unable to find in literature. It's just something that we came up with. <coughs> um, and now, a uh, very fair and honest encoding in actual system of Omega, no jokes, no Agda. We have this text that were on the previous slide, they are literally the same, like you have function that, uh, that takes two types and returns one of them. Uh, this is the unified pattern factor of the tree forest family. Depending on how you instantiate tag, you can get either the pattern factor of tree or the pattern factor of forest. We have encoded here uh, product and some types that we had on the previous slide, uh, th these ones. We don't have data in system of omega, so we need to encode it. Having this unified pattern functor, we can define a unified data type, just as before, and then we get actual data types uh, by instantiating text as appropriate. 
and these are the constructors of this entire family. This is some usual Scott encoding, nothing interesting here. Uh, the, the only thing that uh, is like really related to this case is uh, how we handle uh, IRAP. Uh, IRAP always receives, uh, receives the same pattern functor regardless of whether we construct a tree or a forest because they encode it mm, in terms of the same data type. But it also receives some tags and they are of course different because that is how we distinguish between tree and forest, we use tags. So a node, a node is a constructor of trees and uh, hence it receives a tree tag and kneeling and cons are constructors of forests. That's why they receive forest tags. And this how this actually looks when we print this out in full. So in the Pluto score code base, we have two syntaxes. Uh, one is standard, one classic, it's old. <coughs> and the one is new and readable. This is the readable one. So, <laughs> so when you get errors, this is the swearing that Michael was speaking of. <laughs> That's it. Sure.